So this lesson is going to be on inverse variation. Remember that you can pause this lesson at any time or rewind it if you need to. Um, there's going to be several times where I probably will tell you to pause um, before you actually move on so you can try the problem before you move on. But this is going to be really quick uh, review of what inverse variation is and for those of you that missed the lesson in class the other day. So back in chapter 2 we talked about something called direct variation. And direct variation is a linear equation that has the form y equals kx. So when we talk about direct variation, we're talking about something that is just the slope times x with no b value, no y-intercept in the problem. This would be a simple equation such as y equals 4 times x. And that would be direct variation. So we talked about some examples in real life of this would be something like working at a job and you make dollars per hour. And if you had you, uh, your paycheck and you wanted to figure out what your gross salary was, you would do your salary is equal to whatever you make per hour. Let's just say it's $7 an hour. $7 times the number of hours. That is what direct variation is. And your hours and your salary would be directly related. Thus, the name direct variation. Meaning the more hours you work, the more money you make. And that's usually a pretty obvious thing when you're working a job. And that is direct variation. In this chapter, we are going to be talking about a new type of function called a rational function. And the most basic form of a rational function is called inverse variation. Inverse variation is when you have a function that has the form y equals k divided by x. A constant number divided by x instead of a constant number times x. When you look at this, this would be something like the example y equals 4 divided by x would be an example of something with inverse variation. We're going to go through a couple of real world examples today on this lesson. So we'll get to those here in just a little bit. So I'll kind of hold off on those for just a minute. Notice with direct variation, if you divide this x over here to this side, you are going to get y divided by x is equal to whatever that constant number is right there. And that's something that is a characteristic of direct variation. Every time you take the y value divided by the x value, you're going to get a constant number. That is because it's a constant number times the x value to get the y value. With inverse variation, it's basically the exact opposite of that. Every time you take multiply this x over here, x times y is always going to be a constant number. Again, the reasoning behind that is because every y value is a constant number divided by x. So the characteristics of what makes something direct variation and what makes something inverse variation are basically not exactly mathematically opposites of each other, but very similar to opposites of each other. Direct variation is y equals a constant number times x. Inverse variation is a constant number divided by x. Direct variation, you can find the constant by dividing y by x. Inverse variation, you can find the constant by multiplying x times y. So let's look at a real quick real world example. We're going to imagine ourselves going on a bike ride. And on this bike ride, the thing that we can change, the independent variable, so to speak, is we can change how fast we ride. We can change the miles per hour that we ride our bike. The thing that's going to change if, if we pedal faster or we pedal slower is going to be the time that it takes us to ride that bike ride. So we're going to go with a 24 mile bike ride. 
Now I want you to think ahead with me as we go through these examples here, and I want you to think in your head what you think the examples would be. Obviously I'm not going to be able to take questions from you because I'm doing this on a video, but if we were on a 24 mile bike ride, 24 miles, and we decided we were going to pedal our bike at 3 miles per hour, how long would it take us? That's right, 8 hours. If we decided we wanted to pedal our bike at 6 miles an hour, how long would 24 miles take us? 4 hours. If we decided we wanted to pedal our bikes at 12 miles an hour, 24 miles would only take us 2 hours. And if we decided to get a little exercise out of it and pedal at 24 miles an hour, that bike ride would only take us 1 hour. Notice what's happening here. You are taking the rate and increasing it each time. But the time that it takes you to ride the bike, ride, excuse me, is going down. That is a characteristic, not the only characteristic, but that is a characteristic of inverse variation. Notice as the rate increases, the time decreases. Whereas direct variation, remember we talked about our hours that we work, our salary went up. So, how were you figuring out this time over here? You were actually doing the equation in your head and you just didn't even realize it. The time that it takes to ride that bike ride of 24 miles is 24 divided by the rate. 24 divided by 3 is 8. 24 divided by 6 is 4. 24 divided by 12 is 2. You were finding the time by dividing. And that is what inverse variation looks like. So, when you take a look at each x value and each y value, just like we talked about up here, the x value times the y value is always going to be that constant. So, 3 times 8 is 24. 6 times 4 is 24. 12 times 2 is 24 all the way down through that table. That's what we would expect with inverse variation. And that's going to be one of the major characteristics of that table. We're going to examine that in a more real world situation that we got to watch out for. That constant can vary just a tiny bit in the real world. But for the most part, that's what you're looking for. That's what you see is that constant being the same every time you multiply the x and the y. So this is an example of inverse variation when you are looking in a real world context. So, one of the things that you're going to have to be able to do with inverse variation is write the function given a small amount of information about the function. So, again, you can pause this and try this if you would like, uh, but I'm going to show you how to do one of them and then you'll definitely have one that you can try in just a moment says, suppose that x and y vary inversely. As soon as you hear this phrase here, vary inversely, or inversely related, or inverse variation, you should automatically know the exact same thing I told you on the last page. y is equal to k divided by x, some constant number divided by x. And this would work the same way if you saw direct variation. y would be equal to k times x if it's direct variation. So then you take the information that's given to you. x is equal to 3 when y is equal to negative 5. Write the function that models the inverse variation. So essentially what they are giving you here is they're giving you an x value and a y value from a point on the function, on the graph. And so you can use that x and use that y to find this k. Now if you paid attention on the last page, there's a shortcut. I told you that with inverse variation, the x times the y is always going to be equal to the constant. Now again, we did talk about some real world examples where that might be a little different. We're going to show an actual example of that here in just a moment. So x 
times y is always going to be equal to the k in inverse variation. So x is equal to 3, y is equal to negative 5. You just plug those in and you find the k. So 3 times negative 5 is negative 15. That is my constant. What would that mean? My equation, my function would actually be y equals negative 15 divided by x. So essentially what you're doing is you're using one point and the fact that you know it's inverse variation to find your whole function that then you could use this whole function over and over and over again to find more points. You could plug in an x value and find another y value. You could plug in a y and find another x. Whatever it may be, you could find multiple points. Kind of like what we did when we found multiple points here for our bike ride of 24 miles. So now here's one for you to try on your own. Pause the video, take a chance, see if you can get it right, and then I'm going to put the answer up here. I'm obviously not going to pause, so I'm giving you a little bit of extra time to pause here. So as soon as you see x and y vary inversely, you get y equals k divided by x. That's what your function is going to look like. Again, if it was direct variation, it would be k times x. So you take your x value and your y value and multiply them to get your constant. So 0.3 is my x value. 1.4 is my y value. If I multiply those two together, I can use a calculator if I need to. I get 0.42 is my k value. So what would my actual function be? y equals 0.42 divided by x. So that means every y value in this function would be 0.42 divided by the x value. And you could check it with the one that you used. 0.42 divided by 0.3 should be 1.4. So that's the first type of problem you're going to have to deal with on these. Setting it up and finding the function. The next type of problem that you're going to have to be able to deal with is can you recognize if something is direct variation or inverse variation? So on each one of these, I do want you to pause the video and think about it for just a second before you play the video. I've got two questions for you. Is it direct or inverse variation? And what is the constant of variation? Basically, what's the K? So pause and watch. So on this first one, notice that the x values are going up and the y values are going up. To me, that first clue tells me direct variation because inverse variation should be x values going up and y values going down. This is more like the salary example that we talked about working at a job. And you would be right. This one is direct variation. Now, how do I know that for sure? It's not just because the X's are going up and the Y's are going up. It's because when I look at this X value, I multiply it by the same number to get the Y value every time. And what is that number? The Y value is equal to three times the X value. Now, how did I figure that out? Well, the way I figured it out, as soon as I thought it was direct variation, I went back and I thought to myself, just like Mr. Harrison told me, in direct variation, the y value divided by the x value is always going to be the constant. So what is 1.5 divided by 0.5? 3. What's 6 divided by 2? 3. What's 18 divided by 6? 3. Sorry. So that means every y value is three times the x value. That's exactly what direct variation means. All right, pause and take a look at this one. Same two questions. Is it direct or inverse? And what is the constant of variation? So notice on this one that the x's go up 
but the whys are going down. So most of you, your first thought would be inverse variation. And again, you'd be right, but you'd probably be lucky because you didn't actually know why you picked it. You need to make sure you understand it's not just because the X's are going up and the Y's are going down. That's not the only reason it's inverse variation. Remember the key with inverse variation is that Y is equal to some constant number divided by X. Or we also noticed that back over here for inverse variation the X value times the Y value is always the same number. Remember, 3 times 8, 6 times 4, 12 times 2, all 24. So look at these numbers over here. What's 0 0.2 times 12? 2.4. What's 0 0.6 times 4? 2.4. What's 1.2 times 2? 2.4. If you take the x value times the y value, you get 2.4 every single time. Again, we talked about in a real-life context, sometimes that's going to be a little weird. And I'm going to show you an example of that. But it should be really, really, really close, even in a real-life context, to the same number every time. If it's not, then it's not inverse variation. So take a look at this one. Same two questions. Notice that on this one, the X's are going up. And the Y's are going down, so your first thought is to say inverse variation, right? But this one is actually neither one. Mr. Harrison is tricking me on this one. Because I want you to realize that inverse variation and direct variation are not the only two functions that we have ever learned. Yes, we're kind of focusing in on inverse variation because it's the first type of this rational function we're talking about. It's just not the only ones we've ever learned. 1 times 2 is 2. 2 times 1 is 2. But 3 times 0.5 is 1.5. And that's too far off when we're talking about just a table that Mr. Harrison gives you. In real life, we're going to talk about a context where you can see the x value times the y value give you that constant of variation and it'd be slightly different when we're talking about real-life inverse variation. But when Mr. Harrison gives you a table that's made up, it needs to have that exact same constant number for direct variation or inverse variation. They're just not the only functions we've ever learned. Don't get too hyper-focused on that. So let's look at a real-life example. Heart rates and lifespans for most mammals are inversely related. As soon as you see that, see that inversely related there, you should automatically be thinking, oh, that means that the lifespan is equal to some constant number divided by the heart rate. And I'm going to put R for heart rate instead of putting HR, just to save a little bit of variables here. But guys, Heart rates and lifespans are inversely related means this. It means the exact same thing when we say X and Y are inversely related. So then it says use the table to write a function and then use the function to estimate the average lifespan of a cat with a heart rate of 126 beats a minute. So you're supposed to figure out by using these mammals here, a mouse, a rabbit, a lion, and a horse, what is the actual constant? What's the relationship between the heart rate and the lifespan? What do you divide the heart rate into to get the lifespan? Please be careful here. Notice that the heart rate is in beats per minute. So the lifespan is also in minutes, not in years. If you wanted to change this to years, you'd have to do a lot of math, right? And dividing it by 60 to figure out hours by 24 to figure out date. There's an easier way though, in case some of you know the song. There's 525,600 minutes in a year, if you've ever heard that song. So you could divide these by 525,600 and it would give you the number of years for these lifespans. 
So, we want to find the constant for this situation. So for mammals, we want to do the same thing that we talked about with inverse variation over here. We want to take the x value times the y value. The x value times the y value. So, take a minute in your calculator and multiply the x value times the y value. The x value times the y value. So what that's going to look like is you're going to have your calculator and you're going to multiply. 634 times 1,576,800. 158 times 6,307,200. 76 times 13,140,000. 63 times 1 million or 15 million 768,000. But notice you got different numbers. You got 999 million on the first one. 996 million on this one. 998 million. 993 million. Does that mean that this constant number doesn't actually have a value? Well, if you look at all four of those numbers, remember the first one was 999. They're all really close to each other. Now, some of you, probably one of you at least, will argue, no, Mr. Harrison, 993 million is not close to 999 million. That's 6 million apart. And yes, I do agree that 6 million is a large number. But if somebody offered you $999 million, but then changed their mind and said, no, I'm just going to give you $993 million, you wouldn't argue with them over 6 million. Because of how large these numbers are, 6 million is a relatively small percentage of it. And so what scientists may do in this situation for this constant number is they may take that and they may just average all those numbers together and find an average number for the constant. Average 999 million, 996, 998, 993. Maybe they'll take the median number or the um, take a look at the, you know, just all four of the numbers and just pick one of them that's in the middle. So when you look at finding this constant number in a real-world situation, sometimes scientists run into a little bit of a problem that the real world is not always perfect mathematically. But we can all agree that there seems to be a pretty close agreement between these numbers. And so what we're going to do, just to save a little bit of a headache of not having to go through and uh, actually average all those numbers out, is we're going to make it really, really easy. We're going to round our number here to a billion. We're going to round that constant number to a billion. So we got 999 million, 996 million, 998 million, 993 million. We're going to round it to a billion. Now, what does that billion actually represent? That billion is a billion beats of the heart in a lifespan meaning that mammals typically have a billion beats to their heart. That's kind of interesting. So if we wanted to figure out how long this cat's going to live, we just take 126 beats per minute and plug it in for the rate. So we take 1 billion, so we take 1 billion, that is 1, followed by 9 zeros, and we divide that by 126 beats per minute for the cat. And now we can use our function to figure out that a cat has 7,936,507 minutes, 508 if you round that up, in its life. So for a cat, its lifespan is approximately 7,936,000 508 minutes. Now, does that sound right mathematically for the number of years? Well, let's check it out. Remember, let's divide this by 525,600 minutes. Sorry. I promised I wouldn't sing to you anymore, right? If you take that and you divide that, well, Mr. Harrison accidentally hit it twice here. Let's see, let's see if I can clear this out here. There we go. Oh, nope. It's doing that double hit again. Now let's try it again. P 
piece of junk calculator, right? 15.0999. So what does that mean? That's about 15 years is the lifespan of a cat. Does that make sense for cats? Probably so. Most cats are around 15 years. Some that live outside <clears throat> might not live quite as long. They might get hit by a car. <laughs> Some that live inside might live longer, depending on how well they're treated. But this shows you how inverse relationships can show up in your life. Now, in class, you can ask your classmates about it. We played around a little bit with, you know, looking at humans. You know, humans' heart rates are somewhere around anywhere from uh, 48, if you're 45 or somewhere like that, for Michael Phelps. Really, really good athletes, all the way up into the 80s, for some of you, possibly. Um, mine has been in the uh, 80s before. Uh, I think mine right now is currently about 52. But you can figure out how your lifespan should look. And it's interesting that the lifespan of humans, even though we're mammals, doesn't line up very well with this function, because we have a little bit more medical advances, possibly. And we might be a little different than the rest of the animals. But that's up for debate. I guess you could debate that with me. So the last thing that we're going to look at is a combined variation. Now, what a combined variation is, is exactly what it sounds like. You're combining direct and inverse variations in more complicated relationships. Now when you read that word complicated... Don't panic on me and think, oh, yep, this is where I get lost. This, I understood it till this point. Remember, complicated doesn't have to mean that the math is difficult. It just means the relationships are more involved. There's more going on in one problem. So, I've got a couple of examples here. The first one says, Z varies directly or jointly. Sometimes you'll see this in your textbook with X and Y. So what does it say? It varies directly. This is direct variation, not inverse variation. So what did we say about direct variation? We said it was a constant number times the variable. So when you see Z varies directly with X and Y, that means Z equals K times x and y. It's a constant number times x and y because it varies directly with both of them. That's what the word and means. So, when you see z equals k times x and y, that is a direct variation between z and x and y. Now, we could do the same thing that we did earlier if I gave you a z value of, let's say, 24, and I gave you an x value of 2 and a y value of 3. You could actually plug those numbers in, 24 for z, 2 for x, and 3 for y, and you could find what k is. That looks crazy. Well, look at it closely. If you do 2 times 3, that's just 6. What is k times 6? That's just 6k. This is actually one of the first types of equations we learn how to solve in algebra. You just divide by 6, and k is equal to 4. 6, 24 divided by 6 is 4. So that means z equals 4 times x and y. So any x value, any y value you plug into here, you can find z, because you know the constant now. That's what it means when we are finding the specific function. This is the general shape of the function, and you'll hear me talk about that next class. So let's look at the next one. z varies directly with x. Notice again, z varies directly with x and inversely with y. Sorry about that. <laughs> inversely with y. Guys, what does direct variation mean? A constant number 
times x. What does inverse variation mean? A constant number divided by x. So if you just remember that direct variation means a constant times, inverse variation means a constant divided, then you can set up this guy as well, even though there's two things. Z varies directly with, so Z equals K times X, and inversely with Y, so divided by Y. As long as you know that direct means a constant times, and inverse means a constant divided, you've got your equation. You don't have to have two different constants when you have a combined variation. Just one constant is fine. You could find this constant if you plugged in this x and this y and this z. It would be a little trickier on this one, and I'm not going to take the time to do that in this one, just because I'm trying to make a quicker video here, even though we're already up to 30 minutes. If you plug in the 2, and you plug in the 3, and you plug in the 24, you could multiply the 3 over and then divide by 2, and you would get your constant. I'll give you the answer to that, so it's going to end up giving you 36 times x over y. Alright, let's take a look at the last one. The last one is a little more specific because it talks about some real world things. It says area varies directly with the square of the radius. So area varies directly means k times the square of the radius. Not the square root, but the square of the radius, or radius squared. Now you actually should know the constant on this one before I even give you any numbers. Yep, that's right. It's pi. Pi r squared. Because this is actually how the formula for the area of a circle works out. It's direct variation. As the radius gets bigger, the area of the circle gets bigger. Alright, the last type of problem that you're going to see with combined variation is when I give you the function and you have to write the sentence. So I'm giving you basically the function without the actual numbers in it. Because I'm actually giving you something here that's actually constant. That I'm not giving you the number for it. I want you to write the sentence. So this is actually Newton's Law of Universal Gravitation. The basic idea behind it is this. There is a force between two objects in space. That force is equal to the gravitational constant multiplied by the mass of object 1 times the mass of object 2 divided by the distance squared. But the reason you and I don't bump into each other is because the mass of object 1 and the mass of object 2, you and I don't weigh a lot. Even though the distance between us would be a smaller number. Now, when we compare ourselves with the Earth, it's a different story. The mass of object 1 would be us. The mass of object 2 would be the Earth. That's why the force would be so much bigger, because the mass of the Earth would be a large number up here. And the distance between us is pretty close. As you look at Earth compared to Jupiter, Jupiter is just so far away that the distance down here squared becomes such a big number on the bottom, the force becomes smaller. That's why the Earth doesn't crash into Jupiter. So that law of universal gravitation just talks about how things are attracted to each other. So, now that your science lesson is done, what I want you to do is I want you to write the sentence, just like I've given you the sentence here and here and here for this function. Take a second, pause the video, and try it. Then I'm going to write it on the video.
Now, I imagine you probably didn't write as much detail as I did. Force is directly related to the mass of object 1 and the mass of object 2 because notice it's a constant number times mass 1 and mass 2. So direct means multiplying. Notice I didn't include the constant because it's just a number. And force is inversely related to the distance squared because it's the constant divided by the distance squared. Remember, direct means constant times. Inverse means to constant divided by. If you can remember those two things, these problems should be easier than they look on paper. Now you may have used a variable here like f is directly related to m1 and m2 and f is inversely related to the d squared. And that's fine if you use different variables there. If you didn't write out all the details that I did, that's okay. It's not as big a deal for you to write as many details. So, this is the basics of inverse variation. Remember, inverse variation is the most basic form of this new type of function that we are doing called rational functions. We're going to spend a lot more time with those over the next couple weeks. It's our last type of function that we learn.